Indonesia dalam memerangi radikalisme di Afghanistan. Presiden Afghanistan Muhammad Ashraf Ghani menyatakan negaranya yang selama ini dikenal sebagai basis teroris justru merasa sebagai negara yang menjadi target sasaran terorisme. Berikut wawancara eksklusif rekan kami Kania Sutisnawinata dengan Presiden Afghanistan Muhammad Ashraf Ghani. President Ashraf Ghani, thank you for granting us this interview and welcome to Indonesia. It's a pleasure to be with you, Adam and Rahim. I'm delighted to be here. What is the purpose of your visit to Indonesia? To create a platform for people to people, business to business, government to government, and culture to culture. And why do you think Indonesia is important to Afghanistan? Indonesia is a success having overcome a lot of difficulties. The largest Muslim majority country on earth, a member of G20, the largest economy in ASEAN, and a powerhouse of the future. Uh, Afghanistan has long been associated with radicalism. Um, what is the current condition in Afghanistan? Afghanistan has not been associated with radicalism. Radicalism has been associated with Afghanistan. The distinction is important. Our people are tolerant like the Indonesian people. Radicalism was an outgrowth of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, where we sacrificed one and a half million people. Osama bin Laden was not Afghan. It has to be understood. It was made possible by those. So Afghanistan is a target of radicalism. We suffer most. 20 internationally classified terrorist groups that belong to other countries if targets does so consequently we are doing we are the front line both against these forces but also the first line of defense both for Muslim countries and for the world at large. Mm -hmm. What has been done to improve the security situation in Afghanistan? And by the end of 2014 100, uh, over 140,000 international troops withdrew from the country. The majority of commentators, pundits, thought that we would collapse overnight. The Afghan security forces, that number 354,000, have been able to maintain the country together, defend and de fulfill their patriotic duties. So on an everyday basis, we're enduring sacrifices, but again, the battle is in Afghanistan, but the consequences are global. So we are forging both international sets of relationship as marked by $15 billion of commitment in the Warsaw Conference for the next four years, by about 9,500 international troops that are in an advisory role, they don't fight and equally diplomatically working with the national community, the Muslim community, the Asian nations, and our neighbors. And then nationally mobilizing to make sure that our rights, particularly the rights of our women and children, are secure. Mm -hmm. How do you think Indonesia can play a greater role in the peace process in Afghanistan? Our first issue is that Indonesia is uh, acted with remarkable care and statesmanship to defuse its own internal crisis. When I went to school, that was a long ago in 1960s, living dangerously was the portrait of Indonesia. Today Indonesia is stable and it's done it through democratic process. So as a country that both shares democratic values with us and commitment to peace, we like to have lessons of Indonesia for our peace council that is uh, a national body and at the government level. We've uh, invited, we've asked His Excellency the President to authorize this and we've asked His Excellency the Vice President and the Foreign Minister mm -hmm. to get engaged. Equally, OIC or the Organization of Islamic Countries is where we need to redefine the issues in terms of interpreting Islam as Rahmatullah Alami, mm -hmm. not as uh, the image that a tiny majority is projected. And then there's the state-to-state -state level infraction because some of the threats come from our neighbors, 
and there Indonesia again can play an important role. Mm -hmm. What are some of the uh, some of the examples you you've mentioned examples from Indonesia? What are some of the examples that can be implemented from Indonesia in Afghanistan? Uh, your ambassador has particularly expressed interest in Indonesian values such as uh, pluralism and tolerance. How can these values be shared? Well, Indonesia is 17,000 islands. Holding this level of diversity together requires nation building. And Indonesia has succeeded in building a nation. This process of nation building, which has gone hand in hand, in the last 20 years with the process of building democratic participation or is important. Senses that how people participate, how we avoid zero-sum games or winner-take-all approaches are extremely important. And it's also when after the, the crisis, the uh, financial crisis of 1998, uh, the number of provinces that were either had significant violence or were prone to violence were quite large. The acts that have managed to diffuse these and bring everybody back to the national fold are extremely important. But the other side is also what you're doing in investment and infrastructure. The values, the five key values that Indonesia has, uh, has had from its founding have become in practice extremely important and that is what is significant. Um, in terms of security situation, I'm going to have to ask you this, uh, Mr. President. What can uh, you what can you tell us on the on the growing threat of ISIS and its implications on Muslims, including Indonesia? ISIS is a threat. ISIS is a threat to our values because ISIS is dedicated to the destruction of everything that Indonesia stands for: empowerment of women tolerance, engaging with others, expansion of uh, the regional and global economy. They're, they're targeting our freedoms. They're targeting the contract that is the basis between citizen and state. They're turning a knife to a truck to an instrument of destruction. We're tackling them. The base today has been in eastern Afghanistan and we are using immense force but what is really gratifying is that the people, the ordinary people, the men and women who do extraordinary things, have turned against them. Where is the increasing threat? They are looking for new targets because of their defeat in Iraq, in Syria, so it's going to be. And what makes ISIS distinctive is not based on face-to-face -face networks. It is based on face to Facebook networks. And because of its use of technology, we need to become much more agile. And it also changes. It's like cancer that keeps jumping. Mm. So the entire the reason I'm engaging Indonesia and other countries is because our today's uh, peace does not mean that tomorrow there will not be a threat. But if we come together and focus, we can continue. We share democracy. Afghanistan's distinctiveness is that I'm an elected president, uh, a man uh, without money or uh, traditional based politics. And to eradicate the spread of radicalism and also to prevent terrorism. Well, one part of it is clearly to deal with narcotics. Criminal politics is a base in criminal economics. Narcotics smuggling, illicit economies, whether smuggling of human beings or human parts or others, are part of the same thing. We have to go after financing of this network. Second is intelligence sharing. These threats do not travel with passports and visas. They are uh, across and therefore understanding we should not uh, take the current situation for granted. And third is to cooperate in earnest across the national level, regional level, Asia-wide, Muslim world, and internationally, because alignment and common understanding. When some governments use 
violent groups as an instrument of their policy for short-term gains, all of us become losers. But if there is a common understanding and a common stand against them, then that becomes easier to contain it and eventually to eliminate the phenomenon. Uh, Afghanistan's economy has been uh, largely dependent on international aid since uh, 2001. What has changed since then? Well, from 2001, first look at the situation. The invasion of Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, followed by the internal uh, and regional conflicts in Afghanistan cost us $240 billion between 1978 and 2001. So everything, while the rest of the world shrank, we lost our infrastructure. Uh, travel between two cities that used to take two hours in 2002 would take up to 17 hours. We've rebuilt, so one portion of the investment has gone into this. But after 2014, the international forces withdrew, and that was the greatest market. The growth since then, we recovered in 2014, despite an immense uh, recession bordering on a depression, we uh, registered 1.6% growth. We increased the revenue by 25%. In 2016, uh, the figures are just up. We've had about 3%, uh, 25 uh, to 3% because it's been finalized, and we increased revenue again by 35%. This year, we are poised. Uh, between 3 to 5% rate of growth, so we're sustaining it. Second, we now are focused on our key resources. Our greatest resource is our location, because we are literally at the heart of Asia. So we are creating railways, fiber optic lines, transmission lines, uh, all set of connectivities. We've diversified our trade from South Asia to Central Asia in Europe, we are securing major investment from the private sector, from dams uh, to privatization of the fiber optics line, uh, to uh, housing, uh, real estate, and others. In other words, we have come with a strategy that's called self-reliance, where the utilization of the domestic resource would be key. What our water resource, we finished two dams after 40 years. We are starting 29 more because our water, we could harness about 18 billion cubic meters of water, and we are on the way. And then it's our mineral wealth. 33% of our mineral wealth is estimated uh, at $3 trillion. This is belonging to future generations, so I'm extremely careful that we do not have cars of the plenty, that the rents from this do not spoil our political system. And in order to do that, we have reformed our court system, our attorney general, and our Supreme Court chief are among the most honest and people with integrity and judgment. And now we are reorganizing. The administration has become six years younger in the course of the last two and a half years. The younger generation, men and women, are really getting at the helm of affairs, and I'm sure that they would establish relations with their cohorts, uh, including Indonesia, to present a different face of Afghanistan and give it a different moment. Mm. How can Indonesia support Afghanistan in these efforts in the areas of economic and trade? Well, first of all, our bilateral trade is minimal. So we've both agreed. Uh, I've had a fantastic meeting uh, with the Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, and His Excellency uh, the Minister of Industry was there, as well as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, in our dialogue, because trade needs to be consciously worked there. And trade is based on profit. And we have to demonstrate that it's mutually beneficial, and the value chains can be worked. But the first issue is to demonstrate early successes. Once you've done that, we're expecting a major delegation of trade and industry now to visit Indonesia, uh, I mean, and visit Afghanistan from Indonesia, and to see with their own eyes, because seeing is believing, and it's important to have this dialogue.